Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So. Um, um, what I'll do is I'll um, can open up by kind of giving the backstory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what I was going to ask. So the, yeah, that's, video. that's wonderful. There's a lot to it. Um, first of all, my name is Doug Ruffin from the Buffalo History Channel. Um, and what a difference a uh, couple years in the pandemic made. Uh, the first time I was here uh, was in March of 2020, presenting another film. And um, after that, as she said, and the world knows everything shut down. We, we didn't see each other for another two years. And I was not living in Buffalo at the time. I had already moved maybe a couple, about a year or so earlier. So while I was here, I took a bunch of videos and stuff that I filmed over the years. I took that down to Maryland with me where I now live. And um, since I figured I was gonna have some time on my hands, in addition to going to work, I would figure I would start, I, just, I made a plan to start a, a brand new YouTube channel where I would put a lot of my work, upload a lot of my work, and use it as like a networking tool to meet with new people once the pandemic and everything was over. And Mo the body of my work over the years when I was living here was to was documenting the history of Buffalo's black community. And so I took a lot of that work and I just uploaded it to YouTube, called it the Buffalo History Channel, just just simply called it that. I didn't really think much of it when I called it that. You know, just a normal, I didn't really make mean for it to be an actual content creator platform. It was just something to archive and work at. And after I put a few videos up there, the next thing I know as the months went on, it started taking on a life of its own. Uh, I think one of the parts where it really turned the corner was when I did a, a Zoom. I just learned how to use Zoom, because everybody was using Zoom around that time. Mm -hmm. And I did an interview with uh, a gentleman that was the, he was, one of the, he was the founder of the Buffalo chapter of the uh, Black Panther Party here, back in the early 70s, Kevin Blackford. And after I did that interview and posted it up online, it got a, a whole lot of response to it. And so then I started thinking to myself, Ooh, maybe this might be turning, there might be something more to it. This might some, this is something that could probably grow into something bigger. So I started doing more and more different interviews because I just realized that not being in Buffalo and now having this platform at my fingertips now, I could possibly do a bunch of things, a bunch of things that I had wanted to do, but hadn't been able to do. And reach out to people all across the country that I that I already was in contact with, just by being in contact with them on Facebook for many years. So I connect with a lot of people and do a series of interviews that can be seen on the Buffalo History Channel, and that just manifested into a whole an actual content creator platform. And the rest is history with that. Uh, just to fast forward a little bit up to this presentation, I did a different presentation for the um, Birchfield Pink earlier this year, and uh, it was it was for it was for June. It was around it was pertaining to the Buffalo Gym Team, the history of the Buffalo Gym Team. And uh, around the middle of the summer, uh, I was contacted by Terry Alfred from the, uh, the executive director of the Michigan Corridor, and he was interested in me bringing, bringing that, that presentation to the corridor in September. And when we had a Zoom meeting with some of him and his, some of his people, we, was talk, we were talking, and then it kind of pop, thought popped into my head. I told him, listen, I've done a number of different pieces. I've done a number of different pieces on different aspects of the Michigan corridor. Why don't we just, why don't I see if I can put, put it all together in like one little compilation, a little brief compilation, and then we can, kind of give, give the audience an idea, of, give a contextual perspective of what the, the Michigan Corridor is supposed to be all about in its history. So we, we agree on that. And it was like in the middle of the summer and I was kind of busy, so I didn't really have a lot of time to actually, so it wasn't really as much a doc, so much of a documentary as much of it was a compilation of different pieces. And uh, you saw some of the clips from the news stations in there's a story with that. Um, back in the 90s, I was on the Juneteenth Committee and um, part of the uh, Public Relations Committee. And we had a meeting with Channel 2. 
and we were talking about just brainstorming how to advertise the Juneteenth to the city of Buffalo. And they came up with the idea to produce a television show on the Juneteenth, which you saw as Juneteenth of Celebration Freedom. And they did that in 1999, and they would actually end up producing a series of those, those shows from 1999 to 2006. So that, and then I guess, I, I guess not to be out there, Channel 4 started doing a number of different pieces of Road to Freedom, and uh, um, they, you know, they did another one I can't, that I can't think of right now, but they did a series of productions as well. And um, that was also right around the time with the um, Michigan Corridor that they were starting to build that up around the, the 90s and the early 2000s. So everything was timely and then I made sure as I put it together, mm -hmm. everything was connected. So yeah. that's, that's kind of the, the, I'm trying to abbreviate some of these stories as I do these presentations. Right. I mean, in some ways I felt like it was very appropriate to have more of a compilation rather than a documentary because it was yeah. very episodic and that's kind of how history is, right. you know, like it is not this neat little story in many mm -hmm. ways. It's it's more like a, a whole bunch of um, little yeah. stories. But um, I, I especially really love that piece that you, you narrated about the little Harlem yeah. Hotel and yeah. I felt like what I noticed there is that you were, um, the way you were talking about history um, really indicated very strongly that you know exactly who your audience is. So can you talk a little bit about your process, about how, how you think about the life of your pieces after you edit them and what your audience is going to be and for whom you're making these pieces? Uh, usually when I'm, whenever I'm projected to an audience, I, I usually try to go for whoever, whoever appeals to, because sometimes, sometimes people may think that I'm, some, sometimes people think I'm trying to appeal more to people that are older, which is not necessary. It's necessary no, I think it's we, like so important. We actually get a lot of, I'm surprised at how many young people actually watch the channel, which, which, really, which, really, which really surprised me a lot of times. Right? And I'm, I meet a lot of young people that actually take an in, that have an interest in history, that are in even in activism, and you have a lot of young young professionals out here that are looking. That many people would have left Buffalo over the years. You have a lot of young people that stay here mm -hmm. and that are working really hard to build build up the city of Buffalo. So, and they've taken a major interest in a lot of what's being shown on on the Buffalo History Channel, many of which are part of uh, the uh, New Level Up program. That uh, legislator April Baskin is, is spearheading, which mm -hmm. is trying to build up black businesses in, in the African, -Ameri African American communities. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to do um, archival research to find mm -hmm. stuff from the news stations in Buffalo, yes. and they're not well organized. It, it's not like some neat archive sitting somewhere. Right. So I'm wondering, how are you finding these old news pieces? What's your process? Are people giving them to you, or did you save them, or what? Well, what happened was they were actually saved. Uh, the story with that is back when I was doing the piece on the build organizations, back in the mid-90s, when I really started here on this whole journey. Um, I was working in TV at the time. I was working part-time between WEB and WIBB. And when I remember one day, I just asked the operations manager at WIBB, do you have any Old, I'm, I'm working on a documentary on the build organization. Do you have any old footage of, of the build organization? He said they didn't have any, but they took a lot of their films and gave it to the historical society at the time. When I, I remember when I called the historical society, they said they gave it, they, they had it, but then they gave it to Canisius College. <laughs> so then I went to Canisius College, met Terry Fisher, and uh, he said, sure, we have it. And he, he takes me down to the, to the room, and I knew that there was a catch. <laughs> so he, he opens up this door. He said, I don't know how you're going to look through all this, but open the door. Open good the luck door to you. Says, have, have fun. Good luck. And I, I just see a room about this size full of nothing but boxes to look through. But uh, I, looked, I looked up and down that room, and I said, you know what? I'm up for the challenge. 
So I started looking through the boxes. Luckily, I found a, a few boxes of car catalogs that, so I, that I was able to go through and they, they, everything was cataloged in there. And also, I did, I, I'd actually done research by looking through a lot of news articles. So I remember, on news articles. So I had to go down and get my folders of news articles and go, go through the car, go through the different years. And, and then I, I was actually, the boxes were numbered. So I was able, so a few, a number of the films initially I was able to find. So that's, that's how I obtained a lot of that. And they had those films up there from, for a good number of years before the, the Buffalo broadcasters took it. Yeah, and they still have them. I mean, I think a lot of Buffalo's history is actually really hidden. Yeah, In these old, is. you know, news archives that have never been organized. Right. This is like something I know a lot of people. I, I know a lot of people have tried to like make contact with them and try and. and I guess what is it still at Canisius or? They're just no. They're uh, broadcasters has some. One station has their own. It's uh -huh. like they're spread around. Yeah, because I've lost. I've even lost con contact with that since since it, it left Canisius and they they took it over. I think they had it somewhere downtown. Like, There's a place downtown. It's yeah. like a warehouse full. A well, warehouse. At that, least one station stuff. Yeah, I went. I went there at one point and looked looked around. But other than that, I, I I was able to keep a lot. When I got it trained, I used to get it transferred to big photo, and um, I, I just stuff that I transferred. I just held on to the tapes throughout the years, and because I knew it was, I knew the importance of it, so I just saved the tapes. And, You're doing a great project. Yeah, it's really amazing to see all this together. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So this is all. So a lot of the work I've done over the years is pretty much led up to creating that platform. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, are there other questions from yeah, Liz? Is, is there a capacity in which the work that you're doing is not only, I understand you say that the youth are engaging in, in, in your work, but is it being brought to them in the school environments directly? Like, uh, is there a Buffalo history portion? I don't know how New York State I don't know if there's a component in which there's like you know, form, formally, city. there isn't one formally that at least that I that I know of and at least since I've right. gone. I know I've been told a few times that some people have gone to my YouTube channel and have played different right. parts right. of it right. for for the classes, like stuff on Michigan Avenue, stuff on the uh, Black Dance Workshop. Uh, one of the um, founders of that had passed away a few years earlier. Von Brown, and uh, they, they did a whole tribute to her, and they used a lot of the videos on that channel, on the on the YouTube channel, to present to, towards the school. But nothing, nothing's formally, nothing's formally been set up in, in the public yeah, education like that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think um, I think since Common Core, I think people don't teach local history that much anymore right. in high schools and. And that's a real problem. I think local history really is what ties you to your community and you need to know ab about it. But um, I think it's not really that much part of the curriculum as, as far as I know. But I think it's fascinating. I mean, there's so much stuff that we know, we suspect mm -hmm. is out there and, and we have the capabilities to create a master index, yeah. but we don't even know where to begin looking. Like, like New York City. Every so many years, they'd go around and they'd take a picture of every single property in the city for assessment purposes. So they'd have a picture that you want to challenge the assessment. It's only about four years ago, somebody actually discovered that all of these pictures and every reassessment, like a time machine, exist of the entire city of New York. And they have it up on, online now. But like, what, what do we have? Like, it could be something like assessment photos, you know, which we wouldn't even connect specifically with black history, which would have pictures of, you know, at different snapshots in time, you know, of, and, and then you sort of, if you can find these photos somewhere, and then you start stumbling on who's walking in and out of the doors. Not just specifically, but just to see kind of like a snapshot of the community. And that's kind of, I'm afraid that there's a lot of pictures, 
you know, printed in shoe boxes, in attics, and you know, it's like now we have to put a call. Yeah, and not only the pictures. I mean, it's like the videotape. You know. Um, like three quarter inch videotape. I mean, it's getting really, really hard to find yeah. even a machine, a machine that can trans uh, transcode that. Um, VHS is getting kind of rare, and that the tape gets damaged. I mean, I just had some tapes transferred um, uh, as part of my work with this film I'm making about Connie Eve. Um, that was moldy. The, the tape was moldy. It had to be baked. It had to go through like a special process. <laughs> and there's only one place in Rochester that really does that. They have like a machine. But it, I think it's going to get harder and harder to preserve these tapes. And the smaller organizations are the ones that are really affected because they don't have the money to transfer the stuff. Um, and they have the really valuable stuff. Like it's small arts organizations, small cultural organizations that are storing stuff that is by just has to get moldy because there's no there's no money. Yeah, I can tell you. Uh, you saw on the screens uh, what that old footage of the Color Musicians Club. Mm -hmm. Now that was on one of those types of uh, three quarter inch tapes, and I can remember earlier this year when we found found it. We found a bunch a bunch of three quarter inch tapes from a channel that used to air on Channel Four. The show was called Afro Central and City Scene. Uh, the gentleman that was part of that show used to host the show. His name was Ron Warford. He passed away a few years ago. And a uh, uh, gentleman discovered the this, this stuff that he, that he had. And he, he had it in his possession. And he told me about it. So we were going through boxes of these old tapes. And one of which was had something on the Color Musicians Club. And we transferred it to DVD. Now, as I was watching it, I remember I was... I, it, it wasn't labeled on the DVD, so you pop these DVDs and you don't know what, sometimes you don't know what's on it. But you look at it and you're surprised. And then as I'm looking at it, the guy says, the host of the show says, but first let's go to the Colored Musicians Club. And the tape was from 1979. And I'm sitting here like, oh my God, are you serious? So they started showing these, this, these images of, of Michigan Street long before it looked like the corridor that it is now. And just to see that old footage of what the Color Musicians Club used to look like. And the whole thing was beautiful, but then all of a sudden all this interference started coming into the tape. And then the audio started going out, and I'm going crazy as I'm looking at it. And uh, so turns out I took the, the three-quarter inch tape, and I took it to a contact that I had in Maryland. And turns out he was able, he was able to repair the tape for me and get it cleaned. And, so now we're able to, you were able to see, to see it, but when you find a lot of those tapes that are that old, you know, they they are moldy, and, and some of the film, the 16 millimeter films that they would shoot on, sometimes those are even worse, because the, the picture quality is fine, but then the audio tracks over the years, they, they, they wear out and they stick to the film and everything, so mm. everything is like, uh, when you discover this stuff, it's, it's somewhat of a crapshoot because you're just hoping that, that when you discover it, everything is going to be intact. Sometimes yeah. it is, no, sometimes yeah. it isn't. Yeah, it's, um, a, it's a process. I, I've, I've got a bunch of old slides mm -hmm. that are associated with a research project that I was working on, and they just destroyed themselves environmentally. They weren't fixed properly or something. They're ectochrome slides. Mm -hmm. So they just really, really, really faded. And what I did was I just scanned them all uh, as they were because I figured that that at least would freeze the process at this one juncture. But now um, there's AI programs that are available that I'm starting to use to revisit these. So if you don't be dissuaded because something is heavily destroyed because if you have pieces mm -hmm. and lots of static and it kind of goes in and out, in and out, in and out, uh, you'll be surprised what technology is about to come down the line that will basically animate the missing pieces. Now, if it's animated, you can't really, you have to, I mean, you have to have that, you know, little caveat that this is slightly animated, but it will also kind of capture generally what's going on. So, and then, there's uh, 
programs out that are dealing with video in that way. So bad video, or even like these grainy, grainy videos uh, can be kind of, I wouldn't say necessarily restored because of the, you know, it might be changing facial expressions mm -hmm. and things like that. It's, yeah. uh, it's still in its infancy, yeah. but you can re, you know, you can salvage a lot of stuff. <laughs> but you know, I'm, 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 I got this other idea. And then when I was doing the research for my dissertation, uh, I did a Freedom of, I of Information Act uh, requests for a stuff from like the FBI or the police agencies, mm -hmm. just expecting that I find out that they would have like, you know, maybe reports from cops who are you know surveilling meetings or something. But it turned out that they were collecting video, that they were collecting media. So I got you know all these slides, and I got all these news articles. And it was like I hit a whole hidden archive. And that you had the FBI oh, really that's sniffing that's around, the, uh, the, you know, here, the especially, surveillance when, big time. Right, especially, especially, you know, when the Panthers were getting at it. Yeah. And so that there might be, if uh, doing a FOIA request, a bird-based FOIA request, and do it in association either the journalists to waive fees or do it in association with us here at Upstate mm -hmm. so that we can have an argument for a fee waiver, otherwise I'm just like, you know, Thwarted by charging you an hourly fee, but if it's going to be, uh, if it's if it's going to be released to the public and it's in the public interest, and we get those fees waived, might be an interesting thing. And and, and here, where like you're a, a historian, instead of looking for something specific, mm -hmm. you just cast a wide net, and then you're going to find stuff that all kinds of people are going to be interested in, and might not be what you were looking for. Right. So that might be an interesting. I see. Sometimes I look at some of the they have ch old challenge articles in these books, these big bound books now. So I'm just I'm just not looking for anything. Uh, this visit I've never been looking for anything specific. I just turn the pages and see what see what jumps out at me. And I've been able to do a, craft a lot of stories just from that alone. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's really great. Is your channel um, or you know MSI whatever it is? Mm -hmm. um, are you using it as like you're making compilations, whatever you find, and it's the, it's the work that you put up there? Or is it uh, something that you're thinking about opening up so that other people know stuff up to as well? I am little, I am looking to do, do that in the future. Because it could be like a yeah, YouTube, could, you know? Could, yeah. That would be great. I mean, I just think it's just what a, what a great, you know, like opening to right. become something much larger. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, uh, well, thank you all for coming.